There are serious problems in this world, and business is very good at solving problems. Yes, I think a small percentage of the money that a business makes should be done in strategic philanthropy. If corporations won't pitch in and help the nonprofit sector, you're basically asking the government to do more. I would prefer you gave me my portion of the profits so that I could distribute it to the charities that mean something to my family. And yet you've made that decision for me. Who's right? Uh, John, you sit over here, and we have Kevin over here, and let the debate begin. Now, John has thrown down the gauntlet to Kevin O'Leary by saying business has a higher purpose than just making money. You, on the other hand, Mr. O'Leary, are famous for saying that it's only about making the money if you want a friend, buy a dog. Now, are you willing to repent of this statement and accept John's vision of business, the new vision of conscious capitalism? What say you? I'll, I'll, I'll up the ante. Um, I, I, I like John's presentation, but I'll disagree with a few points. I'll pick on one right away. Business is a war. It's an absolute war. If you don't have that attitude of wiping out your competition, stealing their market share, and salting the ground that they used to be on, <laughs> then I don't want to invest with you because your competitor is going to do that to you. This is a global competition today. Most of my companies compete with Chinese and Indian and Vietnamese knockoffs. We can't even litigate them. We have to fight them every way we can. We try and bring the heavy hand of law here on them, and we do everything in our power to fight them, and it, it, it is a war. So, you know, it, you don't have to like everybody you invest with. You need winners, not losers. So let's start there. I like that analogy a lot, and it's a pep speech I give to most of my companies. John, your response. Well, it's a terrible metaphor. <laughs> no, think about it. I mean, so, Kevin, what are the rules in war? The are, rules there, are, are there rules in war? No, there, there are actually, are there, 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 is, there are rules. There are, are there rules, rules in war. It's called the Geneva Convention. And in the rules of business are set out by governments in each jurisdiction where you compete. There are no rules in China. They just steal from me there, which is why I'm very happy that we have a new administration that is going to hold them to the fire, because I'm sick of it. I've been doing it for 15 years. So, uh, John? So, again, think about it for a minute. Yes, there's competition in business. It's not the primary element about business. Competition occurs. Competition to serve customers better, compete for higher quality, lower prices, an overall better experience. Um, so there's competition. Competition is not a synonym for war. In war, you try to kill people. I, I, I don't know, Kevin, do, do your entrepreneurs, are they permitted to go out and shoot the competition? No, no, but if I can put them out of business, I'm okay with it. So that's not war. So that's competition. Competition does not equal war. So, but to, to, to describe business as war, plays into the hands of the enemies of business, the enemies of capitalism, by making it seem ruthless and uncaring. And because there are no rules in war, Geneva Convention aside, people do things in wars that are horrible. And, and so I think and comparing, you're trying to solve comparing business to war is a bad metaphor. And, and you are playing into the hands of our enemies. In fact, let me just mention that John speaks regularly to MBA students. I have attended where he has spoken to standing room only crowds. No doubt you speak at standing room only crowds too, but probably not on college campuses. I do. Because I do. people probably have a very negative view of your, your view that it's only about making the money. It sounds like you're a very greedy person. Are, is, greed a, is greed a virtue in your business? In your perspective, it has its place. <laughs> and let me explain something that I, I want to point out about your, your presentation, John, which, you know, you are trying to solve a different problem by repositioning business in a way that takes it out of the focus 
right now of a, a very negative connotation, as you've pointed out, it has. It's almost as if business is the ant under the magnifying glass of a 13-year-old burning it on a sidewalk these days. I agree with that. But here's my pushback on that. In the 200 years of capitalism, as it's done all the great work you've detailed, it has been extremely volatile, not only in economic outcome, but it's been very, very volatile in political outcome as well. There are periods in different jurisdictions where being a business leader, you are the devil. And that too passes. You speak about millennials at 40 something percent not liking capitalism. They don't like capitalism till they get their first paycheck and see how much tax they pay. Then things start to change. They become very conservative as they get older. I was too a very liberal 18 year old until I got a job. Then I became a capitalist. And I well, realized that- I employ about 75,000 millennials at this point. Mm -hmm. And they True. don't necessarily change. It's a different generation with different values. That's the point of my presentation is the world is evolving. And we need to change the narrative of business. And yes, there's competition and there's struggle to satisfy people. But business is fundamentally good. It's the value creator. And that's the narrative we should be telling. Now let's talk about employee relations, because Kevin, I read your book, The Cold Hard Truth. Now this is the version that's primarily Canadian, but I presume a lot of the views in there are continuous. So here's, here's one of your outlandish quotes from this book. <laughs> I get up at 4.30 in the morning and I go to bed sometimes as late as midnight. I expect everyone who works for me to keep the same odd and ridiculous hours. You, did you say that with a true, I mean, is this what you believe? Yes, I believe that. And here's why. I do not impose hours on my employees. I simply get together with them, because we're almost a virtual company. I've got companies now where I either have control positions through debt or equity in almost every state, over 50 of them. And I say, look, I don't care about nine to five. It's irrelevant to me. Give me a goal for this quarter and go do it. I don't care how or how long it takes you or whether you can or you can't. If we both agree on the goal, if we both agree that that's what we can achieve, you won't hear from me till the quarter's over. Now, if you miss our targets that we agree to together, three quarters in a row, I am going to fire you. And I do because we agreed on those goals and we did them together and I'm not in your face and if I want to call you at two in the morning, pick up the phone because I give you the reciprocal right. Everybody that I've invested in has my personal cell number and what's amazing about that is the phone never rings. They respect my time as I do theirs, but if they have a problem, I hear from them. And if phone rings, I know it's important. Well, I, so, do, yes, I, I, do. I do have your cell phone number. Maybe I'll try it, <laughs> call you at two in the morning and see what happens. So your business is a little more structured, John. Uh, Whole Foods, you could not, you're not a virtual business. You are, you have to establish certain patterns. And, and I don't think you would impose this kind of restriction on your employees, right? They don't have to follow your own personal uh, sleeping habits, right? Well, John, I, mean, I, I mean, I would say that in the spirit of what Kevin's saying, I, I, I don't think I'd call my, exec, my senior executives at, you know, two o'clock in the morning. I might send them an email if I was up then. They'd <laughs> see it first thing in the morning or a text because, you know, I'm, I'm also a very creative person and I sleep weird hours as well as my wife who's here will attest. Mm -hmm. But, um, I do think it's, I'd respect people's, people have got to, I expect people that, at Whole Foods to work really hard, and they do, um, but I also know they have lives, they have families, and um, it's important that the job be something that they care deeply about and they, and they have a sense of purpose from it, but I do expect people also to care about other things in life. It's not, it, it's not whole life market, it's whole <laughs> foods market. You have a question. I, I do. In, in, the, in the role of, of being their leader and manager, does, does goal setting, achieving it or not achieving it, have different outcomes for these people? Do you keep people that can't achieve goals or do you terminate? 
your mandate with them? Of course. I mean, you have to measure and um, you have to hold people accountable. And I think that's, if you don't have accountability, then you'll have, um, uh, you, you pr won't be successful. So I hope so people, sense, I, don't, I don't have a thumb that if somebody misses their targets three quarters in a row, they're going to get fired. You don't, you don't, hi, you don't, don't fire like Jack Welch, no, the I, lowest 5%. I don't, or, I don't think you should try to manage people by fear. And if people are, for one thing, then people start gaming their goals. It's like, well, I'm going to get fired if I miss this goal, so they're going to lowball the goal and uh, to, to, to make sure they don't get fired. I think when your people are scared, they're less creative. I think it's important you create a work environment where people feel safe, secured, and valued. And as you do that, you still have to hold them accountable. So if people consistently fail and don't do the job, then Kevin's right, you have to remove them. It's so it's, but I, I definitely do approach it differently than I think he does. Kevin, uh, I noticed in your book, you use the term fire a lot. Uh, for example, here's a quote. I could say terminate with extreme <coughs> prejudice instead, but everybody knows what firing means. Uh, quote, this is from your book. Your desk says a lot about you. Keep it clean and orderly. If you work for me and I see a stuffed animal in your workplace, I'll light it on fire, then I'll fire you. <laughs> now, at what time in the morning did you write that? <laughs> I hate the stuffed animals. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> so you're not known as an emotional person, although on that wonderful video that everyone can Google or go to YouTube, uh, you do tear up a little bit talking about your mother and your family. Sure. Uh, Look, I'm not, I'm not a robot. I have, I have feelings. I just, I, <laughs> my, my whole thing about business, and this comes from my experiences in it, and, you know, what I hope is good mentorship now, because I spend a fair amount of my time teaching. Um, I, I believe what I say because I've lived it. And I have a big problem, and I, this is a huge debate I had recently in a graduating cohort at Harvard. And I think it was a fair question, and I'll pose it for you too. I compared investing in two financial services companies, doesn't matter who they are. One had a very philanthropic CEO who was making decisions, hundreds of millions of dollars at a time, on charities that he liked, even though it was a global franchise. And he'd set up a committee. And I challenged him, because I was a shareholder at that time, and said, excuse me, sir, None of the charities you support are ones that I believe in. And mm. I, would you, I would prefer you gave me my portion of the profits so that I could distribute it to the charities that mean something to my family. And yet you've made that decision for me. And, you know, I think it's a fair question any sharehold, shareholder can ask. He tried to position it as a great marketing vehicle. And the ROA on his balance sheet was lower than the woman who was running the other financial services, similar market cap <clears throat> capitalization. She had slightly higher distributions to her shareholders because she didn't give it away to charity. Who's right? You know, uh, Milton Friedman, or the, uh, with that, uh, there's a famous uh, article where Milton Friedman and John Mackey had this big debate about the purpose of business and, and giving to charity. And Milton Friedman made that same point. Let me decide uh, what their money should be used for. John, you took the position that it's a perfectly rightful thing for business to make this decision on how to use some of the profits for charity. I mean, I agree with part of what Kevin said, and I disagree with another part, which is that, yeah, I don't think the CEO should be picking out his favorite charities to give money away from. That's irresponsible. But what I disagree is, is that um, I do think philanthropy can be part of an overall business's strategy in the world for lots of good reasons. Um, for example, Whole Foods has three foundations. One foundation called the Whole Planet Foundation gives microcredit loans around the world. And we've given over 5 million of those now in over 72 countries. And most of those loans are less than $200. And it's had an amazing impact on the morale of our team member base, our customers. We have suppliers supporting it. 
It's, and we only do that in places where we're trading. So we have to already have a relationship with those communities. We have another foundation called the Whole Kids Foundation, where we will give a salad bar or a school gr a garden to any school in America that asks for it. And we've given away close to 10,000 salad bars now and over 6,000 garden grants. Um, so these are two, two of our foundations. And they've had an amazing impact. So w one of the things that's odd about, I always point this out with libertarians who see philanthropy as theft from the shareholders, it's like, there are serious problems in this world. And business is very good at solving problems. And yes, I think a small percentage of the money that a business makes should be done in strategic philanthropy that's consistent with the overall higher purpose and mission of the business. And how much? That's a question each corporation has to decide for itself. It should be transparent. If you're a public company, the shareholders should see it. It shouldn't be arbitrary. But uh, at the end of the day, if corporations won't pitch in and help the nonprofit sector, you're basically asking the government to do more. And uh, there are certain problems that, that government's not going to be able to solve, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't ask them to solve it. I think nonprofits and corporations are better suited to do so. Now, there's one final topic. Very good, John. Um, John, I've heard you give talks to students. So let's talk about students. Um, and you give a talk saying, follow your dream, follow your passion. I remember you giving this talk. Uh, Mark Cuban has said, and, and I don't know where you stand on this, Kevin, but he says, follow the green, not the dream. Follow the green, not the dream. I kind of suspect you are in the Mark Cuban camp, although it seems on Shark Tank, you and Mark Cuban, I don't know, you seem to be a little, little bit of tension there. Um, I know Mark very well. We don't agree on anything. <laughs> and, and that, and that's okay. <laughs> for good television, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, it's... But on this, maybe you do. Well, his point, I think, is well taken because many entrepreneurs fail not understanding that the original vision is not going to be the ultimate outcome. You have to learn how to pivot, and his point is you pivot to the green. You figure out where you can get revenue when you're small. None of the companies I've ever invested in ever made it on their original mandate. It was modified multiple times, and the, the men or women that ran them had figured that out by following what worked and generating sales, and that's, I think, what he means. What I don't agree with him on is structure. I'm, I'm way up on the balance sheet. He'll just do 2% equity, which I think is ridiculous. You'll never get your money back. You'll get diluted into oblivion. But that's a different discussion. But, you know, it's good we don't agree. I think it's great. But I, I, I think the, the, the here's, I'll leave it on this thought from my point of view. When I teach these kids that are graduating, the ones that say they want to be entrepreneurs, which is about a third of a class, whether they become entrepreneurs or not, it's different. I, I leave them with one message that I truly believe. If you think your job, I leave the class saying this, if, I, if you think your job is to solve all of the world's problems as a business leader, you're a fool and you will fail. Your mandate is to take care of your constituents, which are primarily your shareholders and your customers. If you fail there, you'll be terminated. And if you think telling everybody you're going to save every baby whale out there is why you're in business and why you've taken shareholder money, you're going to fail. So that's where you get a huge debate because we are teaching a generation of business leaders not to care about shareholders anymore. And my message is tread lightly on that one, kiddies. You're going to have a real hard time when you get out there. The real world is going to eat you alive. So. Um, so, John, I'll give you the final word. We need to wrap up, so a short response to that. Well, I mean, uh, he's, he set up, a, he set up a, a false, exaggerated situation where you have to solve all the world's problems, save all the whales. I mean, yeah, you can't do that. No individual can do that. But you know what? Collectively, we can solve all the world's problems because human creativity is limitless. I would say, that to the young people that criticize me, for example, it's like, how come you have these problems and these problems? I say, you know, when I got to this planet, it was really screwed up. It really was. It's a lot better today than it was when I was born. Your job, your mission as your generation is to solve the problems that my generation couldn't solve. So 
collectively, we have the intelligence and the creativity to solve the problems. And if we don't do it, if we don't do it collectively, they're not gonna get solved. Sure, you can just go after getting as much money as you can, but you know what, life is short. Life is very short. It's too short to not to follow your heart and not to have and try to have as big an impact for the positive as you can possibly have. I've devoted my life to it. I've gotten very wealthy at the same time. You can do both. Thank you. All right, so one final question from the audience. By a show of hands or by applause, how many are in Kevin O'Leary's camp? All right, how many are in John Mackey's camp? That's why they call me Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you all very much. We'll see you at the luncheon with Kevin O'Leary. That was okay, tremendous. That was, <laughs> that was great, let's head out.